Welcome to this first lecture of the Algebra-Based Physics course. Um, we have two lectures for the first day. Um, this first one is about uh, measurement in physics, uh, in particular about the important concept of error or uncertainty, um, and a little bit about units and unit conversion. The next lecture um, is probably one of the most important lectures of the course, and that will be about the use of vectors, because the use of vectors permeates everything we do in, in the first semester of this course, as well as the second semester. And it's a difficult piece of math to um, figure out. Uh, but right now we'll talk about measurement error and units. Um, so uh, within measurement and error, we'll talk about what we mean by error. So this is actually a, a technical term. Um, which means um, uncertainty. So it's not a, a mistake, it's an expression of the uncertainty in some measurement that you make. We'll talk about why it's necessary. Um, significant digits is um, closely connected to error. The use of significant digits is because of the uncertainty that you want to express in a physical measurement. Uh, and then scientific notation is a convenient way of representing uh, physical measurement uh, numbers um, as a way that they can express their, their significant digits. And then we'll move on and talk about units, um, uh, the SI units, which are the standard scientific system of units that we'll be using in the course, and how you convert from one uh, unit to another, one system of units to another. So to start, let's talk about measurement and error. Um, and first, let's, to talk about why, we should talk about what physics is. And I would say that physics is uh, the science of describing nature. And that may seem a little bit grand, but that's in fact exactly what physicists are trying to do. They're trying to uh, find the most precise and the simplest description for everything in nature. Um, this is a comic called XKCD, which if you don't know, you should go and look up. Um, but physics appears here. Physics, physicists claim that um, chemistry is simply just applied physics. And then, of course, you can go in the other direction. Biology is applied chemistry, psychology, etc., blah, blah, blah. Uh, mathematicians, uh, they live in their own world over there. And one could think that they are the most pure. Of course, uh, philosophers probably have an opinion over on this side over here of mathematicians. So what is physics? Well, there are two types of physicists. There are experimental physicists and theoretical physicists. So experimental physicists, um, they observe nature and make precise um, measurements of nature, including error, and we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, theoretical physicists um, develop physical models, meaning that they develop mathematical models, uh, which, by which we mean equations. Uh, that most simply match nature. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how it's connected to the measurements that are made and the error in those measurements. So a physical measurement um, has three equally important parts. And let's just write down an example um, let's say that we made a measurement of some time, say uh, 0 0.54 seconds, uh, plus or minus 0 0.2 seconds. So what are the three parts of this measurement? Well, there's the number that you measured. That's sort of the amount that you have calculated. Uh, it has to have a units associated to it. So seconds is a, a unit of time. And then the third thing is this piece, which is called the error. An error is just a synonym for the uncertainty 
in the measurement. Um, so you know how to make a measurement. You've used a stopwatch before or a ruler. You know how to look at the instrument and see what the value is, what the, the numerical value is that you get for that measurement. Um, I'm sure that you also have some idea about the units that might be associated, whether you're using uh, a meter stick that has units of centimeters on it, or a yard stick that has units of inches, or a stopwatch that has units of seconds. The error is probably the new thing in this, and it's simply um, something that you describe at the, at the point of making a measurement that um, tells someone who reads your measurement how well you think you understood you made that measurement. So it gives a range of values. You notice this is plus or minus 0 0.2, and it's a way that you sort of um, express where this value falls in that range, meaning um, uh, if someone else made exactly the same measurement with the same tool, then where might they make get the value? And it should fall somewhere in here. So it's not, there's not a strict rule about where the error comes from, but there are some sort of guidelines for it. Um, so let's say, um, so guidelines for error. Uh, we're determining um, so one of them is uh, the instrument. Um, so if you have a, a meter stick which has centimeters on it and maybe it has demarcations down to the millimeter, uh, a rule of thumb is um, half the smallest demarcation. So that would be uh, sort of the instrumental error in making the measurement. Um, but you may also have some uncertainty uh, due to your ability to measure it. So um, the uncertainty due to the um, experimentalist. So that might be like a reaction time if you're using a stopwatch. limitations of, we could say, biology, meaning your ability to see or hear or experience the phenomenon. And you have to come up with some way of quantifying that. So you may have played the game where you try and uh, click the stopwatch as, as quickly as possible to measure your reaction time. That would give you some estimate of um, the error by which you can actually hit the button on the stopwatch. Um, and another one, which is, is probably the most systematic, is um, uncertainty determined by multiple trials. So effectively, the definition of this error is the range in which someone else who is making the same measurement might find the number. Um, so we expect that um, given this, you would find the value uh, between uh, 0 0.34 seconds and 0 0.74 seconds. That's another way that you could express the error. So if that's true, then a good way of estimating the error in a measurement is simply to repeat the measurement a number of times. And if you repeat the measurement a number of times, then you'll get a range of values, and you can find some way of expressing that range of values. So these are the three parts of a physical measurement. Uh, we'll talk about units in the end, um, but at this point I want to focus mostly on error. So let's, let's talk about error. So what's the purpose of error? Um, or the necessity of it, maybe. Well, the main idea is that, um, I guess there are two main reasons. The first is 
um, deciding if two measurements agree. So um, we talked at the top of the page about a particular measurement of time. Um, let's say that that's the amount of time that it takes for someone to hear uh, a baseball being hit uh, based on where they're sitting. So let's say that there's like a baseball field here. Somebody's up here at bat and they hit a ball. And then there's someone standing over here with a stopwatch. So they hit the ball, and sound travels from the bat to the person with the stopwatch. And they said that they made a measurement of, uh, we said 0 0.54 seconds, plus or minus 0 0.2 seconds. So that means that they used a stopwatch, they got a number of 0 0.54 seconds, and then they separately made a decision about what their error would be, uh, and they thought that it was a couple tenths of a second, so plus or minus a couple tenths of a second. Now maybe somebody else would make a measurement, um, let's say from exactly the same distance but at a different point in the stadium, so maybe over here, um, and they also measure the time to hear the bat, the ball being hit by the bat. Um, we might expect that they are exactly the same time, but it's at a different point in the stadium, it's with a different instrument, and it's a different person measuring. So perhaps they make a measurement of 0 0.8 seconds, and they determine that their error is 0 0.5 seconds. Perhaps they didn't bring a stopwatch, and they were just sort of reading it off of uh, their own little clock on their phone. So one can ask, are those two measurements the same? Meaning, if you measure the amount of time it takes for sound to travel a certain distance, is it always the same? Um, if you look at just the numbers, you might say, no, these two numbers are not the same. But the purpose of error is to decide whether measurements agree to within the uncertainty, to within the error. So if we look at these uh, measurements on a number line, uh, let's draw that in red. Um, let's say uh, we have uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Then the first measurement, um, uh, we, which was uh, 0 0.54, would appear uh, somewhere around here. And we could draw that um, as a dot. And then we could express the error with an error bar. So it's an error bar that goes all the way down to 0 0.34 and all the way up to 0 0.74, something like that. Uh, the second measurement appears over here. And its error goes all the way down to 0 0.3, oops, and all the way out to uh, 0 0.11, I guess, goes out to there. And you can see from this picture that the overlap of the two ranges of uncertainty will imply that the two measurements are effectively the same. Now, um, you can see that that's uh, not a completely rigorous argument. The field of statistics that you might take because you're in some sort of life science course um, is a way of rigorously describing whether two numbers agree and rigorously expressing the error in those numbers. Uh, so this is one purpose of error. Uh, the second purpose in physics is um, deciding if a theoretical model agrees with measured data. So um, if we take the example of the, the ball being hit by the bat, um, 
in a baseball park. Um, so here's our batter, here's our bat. It's going to produce some sound, and then maybe uh, we have people. This is the baseball diamond. Uh, maybe we have people scattered in a number of different places. So let's put one person, uh, let's put two people where we had them before. Um, maybe we could say that they're 50 yards away. Uh, and then we could put one person out at 100 yards, another person out at um, 150 yards, and another person out at 200 yards. Or let's say meters, since that's the system of units that we're going to be using. Um, now let's plot the measurements that each of those people made um, uh, on a graph. Uh, so let's plot uh, the time at which the sound was received uh, versus the distance in meters um, at which the, the person is standing relative to the sound. So we're getting a sound that's going out in all directions here at the moment that the bat hits the ball. So um, let's put uh, some distances on here. So let's say that this is 200, 150, 150 meters, and some times. Um, so maybe um, one, two uh, seconds. So we already talked about two of the measurements that were made here, and both of them occurred um, at this position, which was 50 meters away from the point at which the ball was hit. Um, so let's place both of, both of those measurements on this plot. Uh, we had one that was uh, 0 0.54, uh, so that would be something like here, and then we had another one um, at 0. Point, and let's just offset them slightly. We had another one at a 0 0.8, and 0 0.54 had a, an error that looks something like this, and 0 0.8 had an error that looks something like um, like this. I think I added incorrectly when I said that before. If, if you go from 0 0.8 plus or minus 0 0.5, you go to 1.3, not 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so those are two measurements which should be at the same uh, position there, and you can see their overlap again. Um, maybe the person out at 100 meters uh, made a measurement of something like um, 1.1, 1. 1. Um, so, and then they gave some error on their measurement that looks like this. Uh, at 150, maybe it was at like 1.9. And at 200, maybe, um, let's say, a 3.1. So uh, this is some data that was collected on the amount of time it took sound to travel. And that is the work done by an experimental physicist. Now, a theoretical physicist might come through and say, well, what does that imply about the way that sound travels? Um, and effectively, if you're going to put a model to the data, it means that you're going to draw a line through the data points on a graph. So you might say, well, a theoretical physicist might say, OK, here's all my data and I need to draw a line that goes through the data points. So that is the model that describes how sound travels through the air. But because of these error bars, we see that that's silly, because um, effectively each of these data points could be varied somewhere in this range here. And the point of a theoretical physicist is to give you um, the, the best model, the model that best fits the data, but also the simplest model. So we'll cross out that model, and we'll say that the best fit model here is likely a straight line. Uh, maybe I should do it in a different color, green. Something like that. Um, and you want to make it go through the data points as best you can, something like that. So this. Um, is the best fit and simplest model. 
So you can see that it's important for the experimental physicist not only to make a measurement of a number, but also to express the error so that when the theoretical physicist looks at that, they can determine um, uh, what the best and simplest model is that goes through the data. Now in this class, um, you're going to do both. So uh, in the lab course, you're going to make measurements. Um, you're going to determine the error in the measurement that you make. Remember, that's a decision that you make based on the instruments that you have and your idea about how well you made that measurement. Um, and then you're also going to fit um, models to the data. So you'll be doing a lot of best fit lines in the laboratory. Um, in, in the theoretical part of the course, so in this part of the course, um, we'll mostly be trying to understand what, how to use those mathematical models. So how to use those equations and how to use those models to predict things. Um, but you'll be, you'll be a, both an experimental and a theoretical physicist here. So uh, that's an overview of error and why it's necessary. Um, let's talk about uh, a couple other things about error. Uh, and one is the idea of implicit error. and um, significant digits. So uh, we already talked about uh, how you express error as a range, that we could express, for example, uh, 0 0.54 seconds plus or minus 0 0.2 seconds and as one way of expressing error. Um, another way that we might do it is, um, and you might see this in a, in a biological text, you write 0 0.54, and then at the bottom of it, you write uh, the, the bottom of the range, so that would be like 0 0.34, and at the top you write uh, 0 0.74, and of course they don't have to be exactly plus or minus 0 0.2, you could, um, because of the particular experiment you made, that they might have a different range on either side of the number. Uh, and then, of course, we should have our, our units in there. Um, we could also write this as 0 0.54 seconds um, with a range of 0 0.34 to 0 0.74 seconds. Those are all ways of expressing the error. So these are ways of explicit uh, error expression. Implicit error is expressed simply by the number of digits. Um, so 0 0.5 seconds means 0 0.5 seconds plus or minus, say, 0 0.3 seconds. So um, the, the rule of thumb for what it means to express a single digit is that the error is plus or minus a few of that last digit that is expressed. So, um, so plus or minus a few. That's the way that we express error implicitly. So you can see that that sort of saves you a bit of time and space. And it also gives meaning to how many digits you write down when you write down a number. Uh, the reason that we write down this particular number with only one significant digit, the preceding zero doesn't count, um, is because we were told by the experimentalist that their error was in the tenths place. So plus or minus, so 0.5 plus or minus 0.2 means that the error is in the tenths place and we shouldn't be writing more digits because they don't have any meaning because the range would completely uh, overwhelm that, that small, those small digits. Um, so uh, what can we say about that? Well, uh, let's, let's try and say something uh, specifically. Um, a number expressed in this way is called using significant digits. So some examples um, 
we already said that uh, 0 0.54 plus or minus 0 0.2 gives you uh, 0 0.5. Um, if we had 0 0.54 plus or minus 0 0.01, if the experimentalist was more precise in their, um, in their measurement, then that would mean we should write 0 0.54. Um, now this, we say, is one significant digit, and this is two significant digits. Um, if you had a measurement that was uh, 0 0.50 plus or minus 0 0.01, then you would express the two digits after the decimal point in order to get two significant digits. So you can see there's a difference between writing 0 0.5 and writing 0 0.50 because the error in this case is in the tenths place and the error in this place is in the hundreds place. Now um, we can go one step further and that is the calculation with significant digits. So. The idea here is that if you make a number of measurements and then you calculate something with those measurements, you want to preserve the level of uncertainty in your calculated values. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, uh, if you go to grandma's house, and it's a 200-mile drive. Uh, let's give it some more precision. So it's a 205-mile drive. But then, of course, when you get there, you have to walk from the car to the door and that's 50 feet. Well, if somebody asks you how far is it to go to grandma's house, you wouldn't say that it's 205 miles, 0.00003, or whatever it is, to include the 50 feet. You would simply say it's 205 miles. That's what you read on the odometer of your car. And in fact, the 205 miles expresses an error of plus or minus a few miles. And that difference, if you were to measure that again, might come about because you stopped at a rest stop or you had to drive a little bit further to the gas station than the first time you went. So this is a good expression of how far it is to drive to grandma's house. So how do we express that? Well, we're going to express it by truncating in addition or subtraction at the, last, uh, at the smallest decimal place. Um, uh, Maybe we should say the largest decimal place. You'll see what it is in the rules. Um, there's another rule for multiplication, and let's just go to those rules. So the rules are uh, one for multiplication or division. You keep the smallest number of significant digits. So let's try an example. Um, let's say that we wanted to multiply that number that we were using above, 0 0.54, by 0 0.2. I don't know why, but let's say that we had those two numbers. We'll leave off their units for now. Well, the answer to that is, uh, well, 54 times 2 is 108. So I guess this is going to be 0 0.108, right? Um, now, that's not the number that you should report, because this number here has two significant digits, but this number only has one significant digit. So using the rule, we keep the smallest number of significant digits, meaning of the things that we're multiplying together. So that is one. So we should only keep one significant digit on this, so we say it is 0 0.1. And um, 
you might round at this point uh, to the nearest uh, digit. In this case, we have 0 0.10, so it just becomes 0 0.1. Um, the second rule is the rule for addition or subtraction. And that rule is that you truncate at the largest decimal place. So um, let's say we add those two numbers together. We have 0 0.54 and we add it to 0 0.2. Well, that is uh, 4, 7, 0 0.74. Um, but if you look here, um, the, the largest decimal place of the two numbers is in the tenths place. So that means we need to truncate this number in the tenths place as well. So we say that that's actually equal to 0 0.7 instead of 0 0.74. That's the expression of truncating that we were talking about up here with the drive to grandma's house. Um, and again, uh, as, you, as you do that process, uh, you want to plug everything into your calculator and get the full result, but then you do a rounding here. So you again want to round the result here, and again I chose something where we didn't have to round, we didn't have to change the number because of rounding. Um, there's a third rule, a uh, smaller rule, which is um, exact numbers. have an infinite number of significant digits. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that if we were going to take uh, 0 0.54 and multiply it by 10, let's say that we exactly counted 10 times uh, so maybe you measure, made a measurement of length of your book or something, and then you lined 10 books up, and you know exactly that there are 10 books there. Well, that thing would be equal to uh, 5.4, and because you have um, two significant digits here and an infinite number of significant digits here, you should have two significant digits in the result because two is smaller than infinity, and so um, our result is, is 5.4. Okay, so those are the rules of significant digit calculation. Um, I'm not generally going to um, ask you to spend a lot of time on that, but you should have the general idea about um, what the meaning of the number of digits is, that it's related to the error in your result or the error in a measurement and that this, this error should be propagated through in some way by using these rules of calculation. Um, now these are, are basically just sort of shorthand rules. If you take a statistics course, um, there are um, more precise ways of doing that, and, and the field is called the propagation of error. So you could look that up and you could find the exact rules for doing such things, but these are really good enough for now. Uh, and in your lab in particular, you might use these as you're going through and making measurements and then making calculations based on the measurements. Okay, um, so uh, let's move on to the last topic um, within uh, error and measurement uh, before we move on to units. Um, and that is scientific notation. And you might already be familiar with this, but let me review it for you. Um, so a question, if you make a measurement um, and it's something like uh, 2,500 miles, so how do you express with implicit error, uh, let's say 2,500 miles, plus or minus 300 miles. So you can see that the error is in the hundreds place here. So this is really like 2,500 plus or minus a few hundred, right? So how do you do that implicitly? 
Well, it's hard to write it like this, and it's not clear whether these trailing zeros are um, significant or not. Now, some people will add another rule to the, to the significant digits calculation rules and say, well, they're not significant unless you place a decimal point here. And then when you place that decimal point, then these two zeros become significant. But then you could say, well, what if I wanted to do plus or minus 30 miles? I can't place a decimal point here. Um, so there's a question about how to do that easily. How do you express implicit error easily? And the answer is to use, significant, uh, use to, uh, scientific notation. Use scientific notation. So the way to write this number in, with scientific notation is to write it as 2.5. That expresses that your error is in this place. But then, of course, 2.5, to make it equal to 2,500, you have to multiply by um, 1,000. So you multiply by 10 to the third, and then you give your units here. So you can see this has two significant digits. Anyone who looks at that number, now that you've been trained in this way, you know what the implicit error is. So you could effectively write out this statement if you wanted to, just by looking at this. Um, and, and you've been able to write it uh, easily there. So scientific notation, just to make it clear, um, is a number x multiplied by 10 to the y, where the y is an exponent, uh, meaning it's an integer, it's an integer exponent, and the x is a number um, that's greater than or equal to 1 and less than 10. Um, so you don't generally want to write scientific notation with something like 0 0.3 out front uh, because you could always uh, incorporate that, that factor of 1 tenth into your exponent. Uh, neither do you want to write it something like 93 times that. You can, of course, it's just math, but the basic idea of scientific notation is to write a number between 1 and 10 multiplying by some um, 10 to some power. Um, so, um, so for example, let's write a, a, a couple more examples. Um, I know that the sun is 93 million miles away. Uh, and from that, you can, you can see that, um, that the error in my estimation is plus or minus a few million miles. How do you write that in scientific notation? Well, that is 9.3 times 10. Uh, 10 to the 6 would be a million, but I have an extra 10 in there, so it's 10 to the 7 miles. Um, another way that you can write this, if you're typing it into a computer, um, is 9.3 E7. Uh, in your calculator, that might be 9.3 EE. That might be a button in your calculator. 7. Um, but this expression will work if you type it into um, a computer or Excel or sometimes in a calculator. Um, and of course, you can use negative numbers as well. Um, so, uh, for instance, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 11 you could write as uh, 9.1e minus 11, something like that. So that's scientific notation. The last topic um, is units and unit conversion. Um, and uh, the first thing that one should say about units is that it really doesn't matter what units you use. Um, it's really just um, for convention that we use units that are accepted or that are so-called scientific units. Um, the idea is that you want to be able to make a measurement and compare it with other people, so you use units that everyone else uses. Um, there are also some reasons to use units, um, for example, the metric system, um, that they're more convenient. Uh, you know that the metric system is, is so-called a base 10 system, meaning that a centimeter is one hundredth of a meter, and a kilometer is one is one thousand meters. All of the different units 
uh, come in, in, in powers of 10, uh, whereas some of the more uh, so-called English units that, that we use in the U.S. are, are less nice. Um, a mile is something like 5,200 feet or something like that. A foot is 12 inches, and these are, uh, make it harder to calculate things. So what are the scientific units that we will use? Um, they are called uh, SI units. Um, and that's for um, the French system. There's an accent in there somewhere. International. Interness. I have no idea. I'm mixing French and Spanish here, I think. Um, uh, it might be easier to think of them as MKS units because the base units are meters for length, kilograms for mass, and seconds for time. Um, that is MKG and S. Um, so those are the basic SI units, and they're the one that, that we'll use uh, primarily in this course. The idea is that you want to um, convert whatever things you were given into those units in order to make calculations. And the main reason that you want to do that conversion um, is because uh, there are certain units which are derived from uh, meters, kilograms, and seconds. Um, and they are also in SI units because they're just a name for some combination of those. So um, derived quantities or derived units in SI, um, for example, um, we know that there's an equation F is equal to MA. We're going to be spending a lot of time with that equation um, in a few weeks. Uh, it's Newton's second law. Well, actually, this is a bad version of it because it's really a vector equation, but we don't need that here. Um, if you express that equation in units, uh, the square brackets mean the units of. So this equation now says the units of force are equal to the units of mass times the units of acceleration. So this means units of um, uh, now, we don't know anything about this yet because we haven't started learning phys physics, but acceleration, the units of acceleration, are the units of velocity over the units of time. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time, and you may know that the units of velocity are um, meters per second, and the units of time are seconds, so the units of acceleration are meters per second squared. So in this equation, the units of mass, as we said above, are kilograms, and the units of acceleration are meters per second squared. Those are the units of force. But because force is such a, a commonly used quantity, we have a derived name for that, which is called a Newton. Of course, Newton gets his name on it because he's the one who came up with the equation there. So kilogram times meter per second squared is called a Newton. Those are two exactly same, uh, the same things. Um, now let's talk about conversion of units. Um, so to convert units, um, you first write down an equality meaning an equality between two different uh, unit systems. And then you write it as 1. So the idea is that you write that equality as a fraction that's equal to 1 with no units. And the usefulness of that is that you can multiply any number by 1. So you can multiply the right-hand side of an equation by 1, and it doesn't change the equation. 
You can't do the same thing with 2. You have to multiply both sides of the equation by 2. So uh, let me show you what that means. So uh, one, one uh, conversion that you might want to memorize is that between centimeters and inches, because inches is something that you're familiar with in the United States, and centimeters can be easily converted into the SI unit of meters, because you know that it's 100 centimeters per meter. So this is the equality. 2.54 centimeters is equal to 1 inch. Um, and uh, by expressing it with three digits here, I'm expressing how close I am, uh, what my error is, plus or minus a few hundredths of a centimeter. Um, but then I can do algebra on that equation to write um, that 2.54 centimeters divided by 1 inch is equal to 1. And notice that there are no units here. Um, so what can I do with that? Well, I could do an example. So um, someone in Europe might ask you, what is the standard letter-sized paper that you use? Because their paper is slightly different. They use something called A4. Um, so what is the length of letter which is 8.5 inches by 11 inches in centimeters. So let's just do um, the 11. So 11 inches is equal to, and then the way that I usually do a unit conversion is I rewrite it, 11 inches. And this is the point where I can multiply by 1 on the right-hand side of the equation. You don't have to do that part. But what I mean by it is I can multiply by that ratio that I found, uh, which is 2.54 centimeters over 1 inch. And if I do that, then I get, um, well, first of all, notice that the way that I've written the ratio, I can cancel out the inches, and I'm only left with centimeters. That's the whole point. And if you multiply through, then you get um, I think 22.94 centimeters. Um, and uh, let's do a couple of things. So first of all, that's, that's our result, but maybe we should look at our significant digits just to practice. Um, I think this is exact, or it's exact enough. When they cut that paper, it's down to probably some 10 thousandths of an inch or something. Um, here I've given three significant digits, and here I've given three significant digits. So the rule for multiplication is I use the least. This should only have three. So we could tell our friend in Europe that a letter-sized paper is approximately 22.9 centimeters long. Um, let's do another one. Uh, I'll do one with area because there's a slight complication when you deal with um, a squared unit. Um, so, uh, again, let's talk to our friend in Europe who's used to uh, apartments being advertised in meters squared. Um, what is a 450 square foot apartment in SI units? Remember, SI units are meters, kilograms, seconds, MKS. So the SI unit of area is going to be length squared, which is meters squared. So we need to convert square feet into meters squared. So let's try that out. So the area of the apartment is uh, 450 square feet, which maybe I should write in a nicer way as 450 feet squared. Then I can start to multiply by some things. Well, I know if I want to get rid of feet, um, I can go to inches from there. So I have 12 inches is equal to 1 foot. And then if I want to get rid of inches, I can use the thing that I had above, which is uh, 1 inch is 2.54 centimeters. And then finally, to get to meters, I have 100 centimeters is 1 meter. So what do I get? Well, the centimeters cancel out, the inches cancel out, the feet, feet squared, remember, is feet times feet. So that only cancels out once. So in fact, I need to multiply by each of these things again in 
in order to cancel everything out. So then centimeters cancel, inches cancel, and then the feet cancels. So what is my result? Um, I don't know. I think it's something like uh, 44 meters squared. You can go in and try it out yourself, multiplying through. Um, so uh, I think that that's, that's all. Oh, I just looked it up. It's uh, 40, 41. 0.8 meters squared, and um, if you use significant digits, um, I guess we have uh, the smallest number of significant digits that we have here, or maybe this one, which is 2, uh, 450 plus or minus 20 feet squared, maybe. So maybe we should write this as uh, 42 meters squared. Uh, so that's it for the material. Um, in general, in these lectures, I may ask you a couple of sort of conceptual questions, uh, questions that if we were in the classroom together, you might answer with uh, some sort of response device, like a clicker. Um, we might also do some discussion of it. So I might present a question for you in the classroom and then ask you to think about it for a minute and then talk with your neighbor about it. Um, or make an answer and then talk with your neighbor afterwards. Um, of course, we can't do that when we're online, but you might um, put these questions aside and then pick out uh, somebody else who's, who's in your class and uh, talk to them about the questions. Uh, it's useful to, to discuss these things. So I'm just going to give you a couple of example questions now to sort of practice the technique. These are not related to the stuff that we've just talked about, um, but... Um, Let's take a look at them anyway. So um, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll just show you the question um, for a couple of seconds, and then I'll move on. I'm going to do three questions here, and I'm only going to present them for a couple of seconds because you can pause the video and think about them. Take a minute or so to answer each question, and then I'll come back to them, and uh, we can go through the answers. So here's the first question. Here's the second question. And here's the third question. So uh, now you can restart your video. I hope that everyone um, wrote down an answer for themselves. And maybe if you were able to, contacted a friend and had a little chat about it. Let's go through them. So uh, a bat and a ball cost 110 in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Um, if I didn't think at all, I might say 10 cents. Um, so if it was 10 cents for the ball and the bat costs a dollar more, then the bat would cost $1.10. And the sum of them together would be $1.20. So 10 cents is incorrect. So what is it? Well, it must be less than 10. Uh, it's actually 5 cents. So if we have 5 cents, then the bat is 1.05, and the sum of them is $1.10. OK. Let's look at the next one. Uh, in the lake, you have a patch of lily pads. It doubles every day. And on the 48th day, the patch covers the entire lake. How long would it take to cover half the lake? Well, in this question, I think it's easiest to go backwards. So if you have your lake here, and on the 48th day, it looks like this. Well, what did it look like on the 47th day? Well, each day the patch doubles in size, so it was half the size last time. So this is what it looked like on the 47th day. And that is half the lake. So the answer is 47 days. This question is a little bit weird, but let's go with it. Um, if it takes five machines five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? Well, 
from the initial information, we can think about these machines as sort of running in parallel. So each machine is making one widget, five machines making five widgets, each machine is making one of them, and it took five minutes for the machine to run. Well, if you take 100 machines, then each of those machines will also take five minutes to run, and in that time they'll produce 100 widgets. So the answer is five minutes. So these are not physics questions. Um, they're not random questions. So I, I selected them for a purpose, sort of a trick. Uh, these questions are actually from a, a research project done by psychologists called the Cognitive Reflection Test. Uh, you can look it up. The reference is Frederick from 2005. Um, and the point is that each of these questions are specifically designed to trick you. They're designed to make you not think but instead to just come up with an answer uh, as quickly as possible. So in each one, so for instance, if we go back to the, the bat and the ball, um, you see one ten, you see one dollar more, and you think, oh, ten, and you make that answer. It's not a hard question, because if you then take the next step to say, well, is that correct? Is it really true, as we did? Well, if the, the ball costs ten cents, then the bat is a dollar more, so that would cost 110. The sum of those is 120. That doesn't work. So it's not a hard question to answer. It doesn't involve any high math. But what it requires is an additional step to check yourself, to think about the problem a little bit more than you might do just sort of initially. Uh, the same thing is true for each of these, of these questions. There's sort of a, some answers that are, are designed for you to sort of grab as the first thing that you think about. Um, the, the purpose of this test is to compare what might be called reflective thinking, which is sort of the bad way of doing it, the way that I was just talking about, versus, re uh, sorry, <laughs> the reflective is the good way. Reflexive thinking is sort of like a knee-jerk reaction. Um, the, the good way of doing it is reflective thinking. So you might think of it as stopping to think or checking yourself. Uh, and the reason that I present it here to you um, is because it's sort of fun, but also because um, I like to think about uh, intelligence or being smart as not something that is completely natural to you or even determined by your preparation, but it's something that you can learn. Um, and so we can be smart by trying to be smart, by uh, Whenever we think about something, think about it again. Check yourself to see whether it's correct. Take time to check whether what you're thinking makes sense. Um, and that's something you want to do on these concept questions, but it's something that you want to do throughout this whole course. So as you're trying to work on problems, you want to always check yourself to see whether uh, what you did was correct. Um, if you are not sure if you understand something that you've learned, it's a good idea to try and teach it to someone else. Or if you don't have someone else there, you might try to teach it to yourself out loud, try and give you a, an expression in your own words. Each of these things is an example of sort of stopping to think, of using a reflective uh, thinking, meaning sort of examining your own thoughts to see whether um, what you're doing makes sense. So, um, yeah, there are people who are just smart, but for the rest of us, we can be smart by being reflective, not reflexive. Okay.